Welcome and a blessed Sabbath to you, my dear brothers and sisters. One more time, it is a blessing to be together at the feet of Jesus, albeit not in person, nonetheless one in the presence of the Lord. I want to take your thoughts with me, friends, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 66, verses 18 through 20. Psalm 66, verses 18 through 20. Listen to the words of the psalmist. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Can you hear the joy in the psalmist's heart? The peace, the glad assurance of knowing. That what a blessing it is to know that God attends to the voice of my prayer. Friends, have we paused to recognize what an awesome privilege it is to know that God hears us? Have you paused to recognize that when we pray, we have the ear of God, we have the heart of God? What a blessing it is to know that we serve a God who hears us. He has attended to the voice of our prayers, friends. He's not turned away our prayers, nor his mercy from us. Glory truly be to his name. Let us pray, friends, as we begin. Mighty God, what a blessing it is to know that when we open our hearts to thee, you want to cleanse us from within. It is your desire that nothing would hinder us from coming to you. And the psalmist reminds us if we cherish, if we hold on to, if we're unwilling to let go of iniquity, Lord, our prayers will be hindered. But oh, what a blessing it is to know that God wants to put away every hindrance and take us up in his loving presence and keep us there in his presence, living, rejoicing, celebrating the name of the Lord. Thank you, God, for blessing us with this privilege of worship. Thank you for your manservant, who you have prepared with a message from heaven encouraging us to pray and to seek God in prayer, we pray that we may learn to be close to you, to open our and pour our hearts to you. May your name eternally be praised, Almighty God. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into 
to temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Well, I want to welcome each one of you back to this presentation on the final Herald Praying the Lord's Prayer. This is our second session you know, looking at Jesus' prayer, which we often call the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, and trying to take a deeper dive into the understanding, the meaning, the background of the prayer. So as we do, I invite you to join with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of opening your word once again. We look forward to you speaking to our hearts and teaching us in a practical way that we could apply this prayer to our life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin with a little bit of a review from our last session together, our introductory session. And I want to start with this quotation from Desire of Ages, page 362. For me, it's been a very meaningful quotation, uh, really highlights some key points. As activity increases and men become successful in doing any work for God, there is a danger of trusting to human plans and methods. There is a tendency to pray less and to have less faith. It's interesting, as we become more skillful in doing God's work and more active, activity increases, and then we become successful in doing that work, the tendency is we think we don't need to pray and that we don't need to exercise faith. It's almost as if we've become um, very skillful in what we're doing, professional in what we're doing, and why need we ask for God's presence? Of course, this is a great danger. Like the disciples, we are in danger of losing sight of our dependence on God and seeking to make a savior of our activity. Again, a really key point. Our great danger when we become successful in spiritual work is to lose sight of the fact that we are continually dependent on God. And therefore, we try to make a savior of our activity. We may not think about this very clearly, but really this connects to the Laodicean message in Revelation chapter 3. We often think of Laodicea as kind of a do-nothing church, lukewarm. But as we pull away the, the covers of that verse passage and we look more deeply at it, we really begin to explore it. We see that Laodicea has works. Their works just are lukewarm. In other words, they're, they're a mixture of doing religious work, but also depending on self. And that's a key danger for us. So as we enter again into this idea of Jesus' prayer, our Father, this very short prayer, which is given as a kind of a model prayer, not that we have to pray every word, but it's a model for us, we need to realize that there's this constant dependence on God. And the prayer actually is structured that way to help us understand this. Now, last time we were together, we talked about this, the beginning part of the prayer, Father, our Father, and how in Zephaniah 3.17, it describes that God will sing over us with his love, 
when we come to God in prayer and we use the name Father, it brings joy to his heart, just like when our children call us Father or our grandchildren call us Grandfather, whatever the, the endearing terms are in your culture. This idea of, of intimacy is very important as we think about God. But not only that, we think also of our Father. We think, we realize that we are praying as part of a corporate humanity. We're not simply asking for ourselves, but we're asking for others as well. Now, I didn't highlight this in our first talk, but I'd like to do it now. And that is that there are three petitions that focus on God in the prayer, and then there are petitions that focus on us. So if you were to look in Matthew 6 <clears throat> or in Luke chapter 11, <clears throat> pardon me, either one of those passages that describe the Lord's Prayer, you'll notice that the first part of the prayer is focused on God's name, God's honor, God's kingdom. And then the second part of the prayer comes back and focuses on our needs. And this is appropriate. This is part of the way the prayer should be prayed. And as we noticed last time, may your name be holy. The King James would say, hallowed be your name. But it's a very unusual expression in the original Greek where it's almost like saying, let the fire be hot. Well, we know God's name is holy. But really, when we pray, may your name be holy, we're saying, may that name be holy in us. And then the second petition, let it come, your kingdom. And then the third petition, let it be done, your will. And so we're going to really examine those last two phrases in this presentation together. But again, just as a way of reminder, when we pray, hallowed be your name, or may it be made holy your name, really we're asking the question, are we reflecting God's holiness? Is God's holiness being manifested in us? And we looked in Ezekiel chapter 36, 20 through 26, where God's people had profaned his name. And then it goes on even further, and it talks about what God wants to do to cleanse us and to restore us, to make us instruments of his grace. So the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is extremely practical, very practical. Lord, may your name be holy, but may that holiness be reflected in me. This is a key thought. Well, let's look at the second aspect of the prayer. Let it come, your kingdom. Again, another unusual expression in the Greek. There's kind of this imperative but not that we would command God to have something happen, but really we're praying, your kingdom come, let it come. What are the barriers that restrict the kingdom of God from coming and being fully manifested in this world? Let those barriers be removed. Let it come, your kingdom. Now, when we think about this, we understand that oftentimes there are three views of history. Uh, there's the view of history that, um, kind of like Shakespeare said in Macbeth, that all the world's a stage and all the players upon it are fools. And so there's this idea of history as really not having any aim toward it. It's just this random series of events. This is a very common view of history, really no meaning to history at all. Then there's the Greek view of history. And the Greek view of history was that history was kind of cyclical, that it would go in these waves and these cycles. And we find a hint of that in the expression that history is always repeating itself. Well, it doesn't really repeat, but it certainly looks a lot like things have happened in the past. And part of the reason for that is that we are not gaining the insights that God wants us to from history. But then there's the Jewish view of history, the Hebraic view, the biblical view of history. And that is that history is moving in a direction. It is moving from the original creation 
to recreation from Genesis 1 and 2 to Revelation 21 and 22 where everything is restored. And that's the point of view of history that we need to take. So when we're talking about praying, let your kingdom come, let it come, your kingdom, we're aligning ourselves with this view of history, that history is moving in a direction, that God has a plan, and that God's working out that plan in his life. Now, when we look at the New Testament and we think of um, how the New Testament relates to the kingdom coming in this world, there are three main aspects as well. <clears throat> and I've given you these Bible verses and these main thoughts. We won't look at each one of them yet, but I want to encapsulate the concepts here. One aspect of the kingdom is that it has already come. We see that in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus, uh, Mark announces, you know, the kingdom is here. And in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Matthew chapter 6, the kingdom has already come, but it's still in the future. And we live with this tension that the kingdom is now, but we wait for the fulfillment, fulfillment to come. Too often as Christians, we miss the aspect that the kingdom has come, the kingdom is already here, that when Jesus died and when he rose again, the kingdom broke into this world, that God did something in Jesus Christ, bringing the kingdom into this fallen world. So the kingdom is already here, yet in a sense it's still future. We still wait for it. Another aspect that's brought out here, again in a couple of these verses, 1 Peter 4, 7, Luke 19, 9, the kingdom is near, yet it's far away. It kind of plays off of the first idea that it's already come, but it's still in the future. The kingdom is near, but it's still in the future, but it's never very far away. Because as we look into this world, God's kingdom is already active in this world. And as Christians, we really need to embrace that biblical thought, not that they were waiting for the kingdom sometime in the future when the second coming happens. Yes, that'll be the great manifestation of the kingdom, unquestionably, but the kingdom is being set up now here in this world as the impact of the gospel reaches people's lives and hearts. It brings about the fruition of the kingdom. And then signs are given to tell us when we're getting close to the kingdom, but those signs never really determine when it's coming. That's a very important point. So let's turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, um, where we find in Matthew 24, Jesus describing the signs of the kingdom. He, in the first couple of verses in Matthew 24, he tells the disciples that the temple would be thrown down, and they ask the question in verse 3, kind of a double-edged question, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Like, when's the kingdom coming? In verse 4, Jesus says clearly, see to it that no one misleads you. Very first thing we need to recognize about this passage is that it is a warning. Do not be misled. Because there's going to be all sorts of things. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against kingdom. But these are simply the beginning of birth pangs in verse 8. And then he describes many different signs of what will take place before the kingdom coming. But then we jump down to verse 36. Even though we can see the signs in heavens, we can see the falling of the stars, we can see the spring coming in the buds of the fig tree. Jesus uses this as an example in verse 32. We know that it's near right at the door, verse 33. But, verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So there are signs, yet we can never really determine exactly when it's coming. This is an important point. As we're praying the Lord's Prayer, Lord, let it come, your kingdom. 
and we're beginning to work toward the coming of the kingdom, and we see signs unfolding around us, we need to be aware, again, the kingdom is now, but it's coming. It's near, but it's far away, but not so far. There are signs given, but they never really determine exactly when it's coming. And particularly, we need to be cautious about this. As we see things unfolding in history, signs of a different variety, our tendency is to say, oh, well, now the kingdom is coming now. But as we realize the Lord's Prayer protects us from setting times, the Lord's Prayer protects us from misinterpreting things that are happening around us so that we don't jump to, now this is the kingdom coming. There are signs given, but it never determines exactly when the kingdom will come. So as we continue to pray, your kingdom, let it come, we need to also understand that the kingdom of God from a Jewish perspective is really God's power establishing justice and salvation. Now, when we talk about both of these, they're very broad terms. From a biblical perspective, justice is making things right in this world. And justice is a great theme throughout the Hebrew prophets and in through the New Testament as well. We think of the unjust judge in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, who would not give the widow respite. You know, he was an unjust judge. And in the Hebrew scriptures as well, in the Old Testament, the prophets are constantly talking about the importance of justice. So when we pray, your kingdom come, Yes, we are looking for an eternal kingdom. We are looking ultimately for the end of sin. But at the same time, since the kingdom of God is here, we are also wanting to see justice brought out in this world. We're also praying from a Jewish perspective, a biblical perspective, that the kingdom of God is God's power to establish justice, but also salvation, to bring health and healing, wholeness in community, oneness with one another, bringing us from different cultures and backgrounds into one family of God, that shows the kingdom of God in existence. And when within the church, which is supposed to be kind of this beachhead of the kingdom of God here on earth, when within the church we find divisions, we find strife, we find separation, that is undoing the kingdom of God. So as we pray, Thy kingdom come, let it come, your kingdom. We're praying for justice. We're praying for God to manifest himself in the kingdom. We're also praying that there would be this harmonious situation, that there would be salvation, yes, individual forgiveness. But more than that, God would draw us together into a community, into a body of believers that respect the the um, family that he has put them in. This is all part of the idea, let it come, your kingdom. Are you really working for the kingdom? Now, it's important for us to understand this, that God's kingdom is established through self-denial and self-sacrifice. Turn with me to the God, excuse me, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, a tremendous passage. i love to go into it with more detail with you, but in Revelation 5, the scene opens. There's one sitting on the throne. The father is sitting on the throne, and he has this book in his he hand, and it's sealed with seven seals. It's written inside and with outside, and nobody is found worthy to open the book, and this causes great consternation in heaven, where heaven and earth, there's silence when the question is asked, who is worthy to open the book? Nobody's found worthy to open the book in heaven and earth or under the earth. And John, when he hears this, he begins to weep greatly, just strong, intense crying, reflective of the crying that Peter did when he denied Christ. Very deep weeping because he realizes that it's essential for the portrayal of the kingdom to come for someone to be found worthy to open the book. So Revelation 5 and verse 4, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or 
to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. The lion from the tribe of Judah has overcome, has prevailed, has overcome, so as to open the book and its seven seals. The lion from the tribe of Judah, that's a kingly metaphor. The lion, a kingly animal. Judah, the tribe of the kings of Israel. The root of David from Isaiah chapter 11. Another kingly metaphor. So John hears there is a king. And this king, who's going to set up his kingdom, can open the book. He has overcome. He has been victorious in the war. And we can almost hear John feeling this, sighing this relief of hallelujah, the kingdom is coming. There is a victor. But then in verse 6, John looks to see the victor. He looks to see the king. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the, 20, and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So try to get the picture. John hears there is a victor, there's a king, there's the lion from the tribe of Judah who has prevailed, who's overcome to open the book and to break the seals. He is going to establish the kingdom. And then when John turns to look to see this kingly power, this lion, what does he see? He sees the slain lamb. What is, what is being taught to us in this image in the book of Revelation? very clearly that God's kingdom is established through self-denial and self-sacrifice. Self-denial and self-sacrifice. We want to pray, let it come, your kingdom. That needs to impact my life and yours. Excuse me, my life and yours. Are we living a life characterized by self-denial and self-sacrifice. Those who are really praying for the kingdom to come, they're not to be this inward-looking group of people. And, and sometimes we fall into that. Oh, we can't wait for the kingdom to come because of how it affects us. Remember, the prayer is broader. Our Father, who is in heaven, let your name be holy. Let your kingdom come. A much broader perspective as we think about praying for the kingdom? Are we praying that we would be the self-denial, self-denying, self-sacrificing people that would help usher in the kingdom? Are we living as kingdom people, showing one another, showing other people what it's like that they can become part of the kingdom now, that they're welcomed into our community of faith, our, our covenant family of faith, where they too become members of the kingdom. This is what Jesus is trying to bring to us when he calls us to pray, let it come, your kingdom. Now the next petition, the third petition, third and final petition that focuses on God in the prayer, is let it be done, your will. Again, slightly unusual construction in the Greek. And this, this prayer is, is actually kind of perplexing if we think about it. You could think of different countries in which there might still be a, a king, Saudi Arabia or um, some other countries around the world where there are still kings in power, kings or queens in power. Or perhaps you could think of a country in which the ruler is a dictator. It's very hard in those kind of settings to imagine saying something like, let your will be done. Well, in a dictatorship with a king and a kingdom, clearly the king's will is going to be done. But here's this unusual prayer, let it be done your will. You see, each one of these prayers, let it be hallowed your name, let it come your kingdom, let it be done your will, they show us the cooperative aspect between us and God. Yes, God is sovereign. God is almighty. God uh, is, again, as I said, God is all-powerful, omnipotent, um, omniscient. He knows everything. And yet at the same time, he invites us into praying with him to bring the kingdom 
into fruition. So let it be done your will. Let it be done your will. And again, actually, clearly what we're praying here is the first place that will needs to be done is in my life. So God's not going to force himself. We see that clearly in scriptures. But God is calling us freely, voluntarily, to join with him in bringing his kingdom into the world by letting his name be hallowed in us, living a holy life so that we reflect his goodness, praying for the kingdom to come and working for the kingdom to come in our spheres, relieving suffering, praying for, uh, working for justice, bringing people into the fellowship of the kingdom. Let it be done, your will. As we think about scriptures, there's plenty of places where it's very clear what we could always pray things for according for God's will. There are things that we can't pray for. You know, I can't just necessarily pray, well, Lord, you know, I want a new car or I want a bigger house or I want more finances or something like that. Those are things that are not clearly God's will. But here's a list for you that I went through certain scriptures and pulled out some ideas we could always be praying this. This is always God's will that we pray for. A gracious nature, not returning evil for evil. Peter tells us that. That we, our spirit should always be under the control of God. We could always be praying that it's God's will for us to seek the good of other people. How can we help our neighbors and our friends? It's always God's will that we pray for wisdom how to follow his word in scripture. It's always God's will that we pray to avoid evil. It's always God's will that we give thanks in everything. Give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, Paul writes. And it's always God's will that we rejoice. It's also always God's will for him to forgive us quickly. That's a prayer that will never not be answered. Lord, forgive me, restore me, cleanse me. Always God's will to answer that kind of prayer. But there are times in scripture where God's will wasn't, was in conflict or wasn't being manifested or there was a tension, let me say it this way, a tension between God's will and how it would be manifested in the life. We could see this here in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 45, it's that long passage. It's talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 36 through 30, 45, where he goes and he's weighted down, he's heavy, he's praying, he's concerned. And so let's just turn there, Matthew 26, <clears throat> starting in verse 36. They come to the place of Gethsemane, it uh, means an oil press, and in ancient, and in uh, outside of Jerusalem today, there's still this kind of a cave or a grotto in which you could see an ancient olive press had been in this kind of a cave-like area. Potentially, that was the place near where the olive trees were, where Jesus would have been praying. And he says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Please remain here and pray for me. Verse 39 he went a little beyond them, fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So here's the tension. And Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John that he came from heaven to earth to do the will of the Father. Jesus is the greatest example of the Lord's prayer, in a sense, you know, praying to his Father, let it be done, your will. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is really facing the battle with satanic powers, where he's got to make the choice, will I become redemption for the human race? Will I become the sin bearer for the human race? Will I become sin itself on behalf of the human race? Jesus is wrestling with that, and his whole human nature recoils from the idea. He pulls back from the concept that he's going to embrace this. Three times he's praying this. Not my will, but your will be done. 
in our lives as well, there'll be times like that where we sense God calling us one thing and maybe our desires go another way. But as we learn to pray the Lord's Prayer in our daily life, let it be done, your will, we'll gain greater strength and greater ability to fulfill this prayer in the most difficult times. Desire of Ages, Ellen White brings out, with the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with the dread of separation from God. That's his great fear, that he's going to be fully separated from God. Satan told him that if he became surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. He would be identified with Satan's kingdom and would never more be one with God. That was the battle. That was the conflict. And yet, Jesus was willing to do that. In summary, when we pray, your will be done, really what we're praying is, may the reign of evil on this earth be ended, that sin can forever be destroyed. God longs to separate that sin from you and me, that we today could enter into this Lord's Prayer praying with him, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Our Father, let your name be holy in me. Let my life testify to your goodness and holiness. Lord, let me work for the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Help me to see it. Help me to work toward it. Help me to extend the kingdom by sharing the message of what Jesus has done in his life, death, and resurrection, breaking the kingdom into this world now. Lord, let your will be done in my life. Friends, what about you? Has your life been in harmony with the life of God? Have you really been living this kind of a life where your dedication is consistent? Or is God calling you to something deeper? Is he calling you to really walk with Jesus in praying for holiness, the kingdom, and his will to be done in your life?
I invite you to join me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you that the Lord's Prayer is so brief, easy to remember, and yet so comprehensive. May we keep our minds on the things that are most important, your holiness, your kingdom, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen.